Now we're turning, please, to the book of Isaiah and chapter 42. And I just want to read the first four verses. I'll expound them or try to expound them as the Lord helps us. And then we'll go from verse 5 down it line by line. And I really want to cover the whole chapter tonight. It is a great, great chapter. And I think maybe just before we read it, could we go over to Matthew 12 just to prove to you, because some of you are through this teaching for the very first time. I've always got to remember that there are lots of people who are just fresh to the Bible, who are watching on video, listening by audio, wherever you are, and also in this meeting. And Matthew 12 and verse number uh, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. You see, the time is not yet ripe. He is not bombastic and bursting upon the scene. He charges them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flex shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, that shows you very clearly that when we go back, and let's go back now, to Isaiah 42, that the first four verses of Isaiah 42 refer to the Lord Jesus. It's not just my interpretation. These verses are about Christ. Behold my servant, Isaiah 42 and 1, whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flex shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. I'll never forget the first time, friends, when I read F. B. Mayer's beautiful commentary on these four verses. I think they're on my mind now for the rest of my life. I hope they are anyway. He said some lovely things, and I want to repeat some of the things that he said. In his book, Christ in Isaiah, he said, when the Lord Jesus took a towel and washed his disciples' feet, it was no new office that he was performing. For the life of God is a life of service. He rules everything, yes, but at the same time, he serves all. And now Jehovah God the Father is calling us all in this class and in every generation to look at his Son. This is a call by Jehovah to look at his Son to see what kind of a servant he was. Behold, look, everybody, says the first verse. Behold my servant, the one who served me and did perfect obedience to all that I asked him to do. Behold my servant. Now, he is the one that I uphold. 
God loves His Son. God is thrilled with everything He is and everything He did and everything He will yet do. Oh, the pleasure that God gets, has gotten, and yet will get from all that the Lord Jesus is. Of course, He doesn't see it past, present, and future the way we do. But the Lord Jesus brings him great pleasure. And when you put your faith and trust in God's Son, and you exalt Him in your life, think of the pleasure He gets from that. Think of the pleasure He gets from you serving Him and choosing first the kingdom of God. How God loves those who love His Son in a very special way. I wonder, my friend, what you think of Christ tonight. Here's what God thinks, my servant whom I uphold. You know, God is always at work in our world. You think of that breakfast table you sat down to this morning, or that tea table you sat down to, and how it was spread. And behind that bread there is the flour, and behind the flour the mill, and behind the mill and the flour the wheat, and behind the wheat the sun, and behind the sun God. Think of everything spread on that table, how God brought it to you today. Think of that lovely dew that fell on the grass, renewing the grass, and think of the progress of the sun and the moon today, and think of the little fall of the little tiny shell from the, from the ocean to the ocean bed. Think of the flip of every tail of every fish that swims. Incredible. And God knows all about it and is behind it all. But He does it so quietly, and He does it so unobtrusively. I told you about the cartoon I saw in a magazine recently of a man standing, looking out across a beautiful countryside, and there was a lovely rainbow, and he said to his little son, he said, no, son, it's not an advertisement. And the point of the cartoon was that the child had got so used to things that he thought that anything that was presented that was nice or spectacular had got to be an advertisement. No. It's not God trying to sell Himself. It's not God trying to, to be a slick salesman like the world is. Think of how unobtrusive He is. You never saw a mark of Him today as far as blowing trumpets about His creation is concerned. And all of that was done unobtrusively and quietly. Absolutely fantastic. I had a beautiful walk this afternoon. I, I thought I would go for a, a walk and clear my head and quietly walking along a, a river bank. And I just stood there this afternoon, you know, and I heard the singing of the birds and the beauty of all that spring bursting out. And I thought, a wondrous time is spring. Uh, when the trees, they all are blooming and so on. And so it is with God's love once you've experienced it. Here is God behind all of this creation. I think sometimes we, we don't take enough time just to stop for a wee minute. It's like my friend Malcolm Woods of this church says, he said to me, I'm going off for a wee break one of these days. I just want to want, watch the rocks grow for a little while. And I thought that was a lovely expression. Well, I think that Malcolm could teach us all. It would be good now and again if we could maybe sit and watch Maybe just not only the rocks growing, but the whole world around us. We're so busy, aren't we? And we don't have time to appreciate it. God does it all, but He doesn't leave a footmark. There's not a sound from Him. And so it is in the service of the Lord Jesus, because here we have the breathtaking modesty of the Lord Jesus. Being the express image of God's person, watch how he moves just like his father is. And he comes into the earth acclaimed by angels, 
reverenced by strangers, foretold by seers and prophets, and for 30 years he just retires to a little carpenter's shop. I remember preaching in Nazareth once, and one of the local believers, he, he took me down into his carpenter's shop in Nazareth, and how proud he was of that shop. And as I stood there in that believer's carpenter shop in present-day Nazareth, I thought of Christ all those years, sawing and planing and so on. What a wonderful Savior. In the hospice there in Nazareth, when they break bread, uh, what they call the communion table is actually uh, just a table that a carpenter would use with the lathe on it and so on set up there, and I thought it was very beautiful. Our Lord Jesus, acclaimed by all of these for so many hundreds of years, proclaimed by John the Baptist, and what does he do? He doesn't go up to Jerusalem after he's acclaimed by John to say, look, everybody, I'm the anointed one. He goes off into the wilderness, and there is not in the lovely Savior a single grain of self-seeking. No one. Fantastic, isn't it? Not a grain of self-seeking. Think of that time he took to just go and talk to the woman at the well. All that time for one woman. He didn't come to endure. Or rather, he came to endure, but he didn't come to enjoy. He came to be despised, not to be crowned. His design was not to be the idol of the populace. His design was that he could take their hearts away from idols back to God. He didn't hide behind the rich. He didn't hide behind the strong. And he could have called 12 legions of angels, but he refused. No soul-destroying angel smote the man who cleared his throat and spat in the Prince of Peace's face. No lash but his love. No battle axe but grace. Behold my servant, says Jehovah, whom I uphold, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. How beautiful. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And just a wee word here to the Christian. Tell me, Christian, when you go to work for your Lord, or I go to work for my Lord. This church here, you know, it wasn't built to be a denomination. It wasn't built to be a glorification to men. It is here so that it might serve the Lord. This building is here, and we're in here so that we might serve the Lord and exalt Him and exalt Him alone. No sect, no group of men as such that we're trying to say they are better than anybody else. We just want to exalt Him, meet in His name, preach His Word. We want to only be Christians, and we want to be Christians only. As simple as that. Let's hope we'll ever be like that. Let's hope that you will be ever like that in your heart, and that I ever will in my service, that it is for the Lord we do it. Is that the quality of your work for God, that you do it out of obedience to Him, and if God gets pleasure from it and glory from it, that's all that matters. My friend, if in your secret soul you seek for the sweet voice of human adulation, or I do, 
If I am conscious that I want my work to pass into the, the common talk of men so that they'll talk about me, then I can be sure that deterioration has set into my service for God, and there is rottenness in the autumn fruit of my life. Girls, how are you serving the Lord? How are you getting on in that hospital, at Queen's, at Strand, or wherever you are? How are you getting on in that office, in that home, in that family? Are you living for Him? It's very important. Phyllis, from my heart to yours, how are we getting on? Let's just review for a wee minute and let the mighty searchlight of the Word go into my life. How are we getting on? Have we got a fresh vision of Him? Are we doing it for Him? Or are we serving Him because so-and-so might think it is good or somebody else might think it's good? If we start that game, we're finished. Lord Jesus did it for His Father, and He was so modest about it. Are we? You see, anyway, the best work has a humility about it. And what is Christ's work? Well, Christ's work is, notice, He's after bruised reeds, and he's after smoking flax. Those are the two things he's really concerned about. They are, reverently speaking, a great speciality with him. He specializes in bruised reeds and smoking flaxes, and it's humble. Now, let me explain it. You study the Scriptures. Who has God's choicest dealings been with? Well, come on. Who are the people in this book that God has had choice dealings with? What kind of people are they? Shepherd boys taken from their flocks. Youngest sons without repute. Girls growing to spiritual beauty in the obscurity of some highland village somewhere. And God has put down the mighty from their seat and exalted the humble and the weak again and again and again. And so it was with our Lord Jesus. He passed by Herod's palace, and he chose Bethlehem and the manger. He refused Satan's offer of the empires of the world, and he took the way of the cross, and he selected the majority of his disciples from the ranks of the poor. And he left the society of the Pharisee and the scribe, and he expended himself on bruised reeds and smoking flax, on dying thieves, on fallen men and women, and on the peasantry of Galilee. No doubt about that. There were some mighty that were chosen, not all that many, but the common people heard him gladly. Now look, see Christ serving God? Look, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I remember standing watching the open sewer run down the middle of the street in Nazareth, and I stood there on that little narrow street near where the synagogue where Christ had preached, and I stood there and I thought, Lord, if anybody wanted to impress the world with something or other, this is the last place you would start. Think of the, the breathtaking modesty of the Lord Jesus. You know, to have the power and not to use it to be able to wipe them out at the cross, but he didn't. To have the power to snuff them out, but he didn't. If a little midge gets in your eye, you just smudge him out, because he annoys you. 
And think of the times that we've annoyed God and he hasn't smudged us out. He has the power to do it. How kind he is. How good he is. How great he is. I don't know many people who would go too far to find a reed. Do you? There's not much strength in a slender stem of a reed. There's no attractiveness in that fever-breeding swamp where reeds grow. Any reeds I know are in swamps by and large. And if there's anybody you know who would search for a reed, how much less would they search for one that's bruised? Some cow or cattle has trampled on it. It's not broken, but it's bruised. Some fisherman going angling, and he tramps on it, and it's bruised, and it's lying across your path. A bruised reed. Not much use to that. And yet God says, Behold my servant, a bruised reed shall he not break. Maybe sitting in this service tonight, there's somebody with a breaking heart. Now let me be very careful. I've never addressed a congregation anywhere large or small in the world, in any place, up the road or down it, but that there wasn't somebody sitting in that crowd with a breaking heart. And I know you're here tonight, my friend, because human life tells me you are here. And you look happy and well-dressed and seem to be enjoying the meeting, but away in there, you're breaking up. Now, my friend, here is the one for you. Behold, says God, this Lord Jesus, my servant, behold him. He doesn't break bruised reeds. Other people just kick them out of the way, but he doesn't kick them out of the way. He specializes in bruised reeds. You say, ah, but you don't know me, Derek. You don't know the sins I've had. You don't know the past I've had. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know the mess I'm in. But he does. And I just quote God's word to you tonight. A bruised reed shall he not break. The world will break you, and the selfish crowd will ignore you, but he won't. And I just say tonight, with all the authority of the Word of God, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if you're not saved yet, you haven't yet repented of your sin and put your trust in the Savior and his work at Calvary as the basis for salvation and trusted him as your Lord and Savior, trusting his precious blood alone, to cleanse you from sin and his risen life to take you through. Can I say to you tonight, why not at this very moment in this service, excuse the term, bruised reed, trust Christ now. How many stories we could tell of bruised reeds that Christ has taken and mended until they grow straight, Yet everybody else would despise. On smoking flecks, have you ever seen smoking flecks? Well, I haven't. I've seen flecks. My grandmother used to have it on her farm, and I used to sit on the back of the tractor with my uncle Wesley, and he used to take me along in his tractor, and he used to go around the field plowing, and I used to remember that in the corner was the flax dam. And, of course, that was a hangover from the old past of, of Ulster, which was so great in its, in its linen industry, so famous for its flex. There's talk, actually, of resurrecting the industry. I was in the Ulster Museum just uh, on Monday, and I was looking at some of that beautiful linen. How beautiful it is. They, they have it there and explaining how it was made and coming through those huge machines Flax. I haven't seen it smolder, but I've seen flax. And I can well imagine that if you put it all together and you tried to light it, 
that it would smolder because the sparks would not follow along its fibers. Fire in flux is very fitful, very irregular, and very destitute of kindling power. So when God says, Behold my servant, he specializes in bruised reeds, but he also specializes in smoking flex. Smoking flex, he shall not quench. What does that mean? Well, the superficial worker ignores that kind of thing, bruised reeds and smoking flex. Why give me, they say, a huge sphere where I can serve God? Give me a task where my stores of knowledge will have adequate scope. I'll do nothing if I cannot do the best. Those are very foolish words. The best and the noblest work is to bend in a divine humility over those whom the world ignores. Maybe God has sent you to some very difficult children to teach. Maybe you teach in an area of this land where really you're just thinking of giving up even as a school teacher. It's so difficult. But God put you there, didn't he? You wait until he takes you out. If he takes you out, that's all right. But if he doesn't, don't move. Go on. Someone here tonight in a situation where you feel, well, I have talents and really I feel they are wasted. I wish I had a greater sphere in which I could use them. My friend, don't say that. The greatest work often emanates from the most inconspicuous sparks. And the very time that you think you're not being useful for the Lord is the very time he's using you. You ask any preacher and he'll tell you that. The nights he thinks he's getting on well, he's getting nowhere. And the nights he's absolutely hopeless and he goes home ready to give up is the night God's blessing him through the roof, as it were. How often have I found that when I get discouraged and depressed and say, oh, Lord, not again. I can't face it. I have failed and so on. And then suddenly some little word is blessed and the Lord uses it. You see, you've got to remember that the perfect servant had a great perseverance. The Lord Jesus never gets discouraged. That's what verse 4 says. He shall not feel nor be discouraged. He's principally concerned with bruised reeds and smoking flecks. He doesn't stamp out the smoking flecks, even though it's only smoldering. He doesn't stamp it out. And the backslider who maybe once flamed well for God is now smoldering. He doesn't put them out. They're now fitful and they're regular in their Bible reading and in their prayer and so on. He doesn't smudge them out like the Peters of this world. He, he draws them to himself and, and doesn't put out the smoldering flecks. Well, that may principally be his concern. But he's not one or the other. He's not a bruised reed, nor is he a smoking flex. Look at what he did with creation. He persevered in creation until it was all completed and finished, until the heavens and the earth stood forth in their beauty, and it was all good. And that's what it's like in the spiritual world. When Christ sets out to do something and to accomplish a work, then he will stay with that work no matter what. Think of what he went through at Calvary and what they threw at him and what they said to him and what they did to him. And he went on and he persevered until he hung on the tree and he cried those majestic words, Consummate it! It is finished. Perfectly completed. Absolutely adequate for all our spiritual needs. How perfect is the work of Christ. Are you trusting in it alone for salvation? Or trusting just church going or whatever? My friend, trust him alone, and you will have peace with God. And if you are a Christian, rejoice in that finished work. But now that he saved you, he's not going to drop you and ditch you. Think of all the martyrdoms and think of the dark centuries across Europe when the gospel was hidden. Think of the awful, awful times that there were when it seemed as if the very gospel had been entirely lost. But he never gets discouraged. 
He doesn't fail. He doesn't grow dim. He'll not be crushed. He doesn't go to pieces till he has set forth judgment unto truth and set judgment in the earth. And the isles wait for his law. And there's coming a day when he shall rule this whole world from shore to shore. And the very isles wait for his law. Even so come, Lord Jesus, we say. I shall build my church, he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the quality of the best work, is it not? So discouraged one, chin up now. One who's been stopping running for God, get back on that track again. Pick yourself up. Lonely one, discouraged one, here is your Lord. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. He shall not fail. He's not going to fail, and he's not going to be discouraged, and he's going to finish his work. So if you're trusting in him, all is well. Perseverance in the teeth of pitiless criticism, in the teeth of obstinate hate, right through. And what was the secret? Well, I think the secret in a very real sense was that Holy Spirit there. Notice it says, verse 1, I have put my Spirit upon him. Thank God for his Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian, you're endued with him. He is within you. Every Christian, when they get saved, the Bible says, are baptized in the Spirit. I believe that comes with conversion. And I believe with all of my heart that you have all of that Holy Spirit within you, but does he have all of you? You have all of him, but does he have all of you? Are you holding back from him? Let that blessed Spirit endure you and guide you. Let him have his way in your life when you feel him leading you. Don't resist him. Grieve not that blessed Holy Spirit of God. He is very easily grieved. Oh, how blessed when he endures us with power. And uh, that was the Lord Jesus going forward now, and the Spirit there, and the Father and the Spirit and the Son together doing this perfect work. Isn't it beautiful? Written by Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came. A perfect description of our lovely Lord Jesus, who never gets discouraged. Ah, but we now move to God in verse 5, beginning to promise this coming Messiah. And in verse 5, he says, Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. Look at God as the great creator. He created the heavens, and he stretched them out. Look at the great initiator, as well as creator. He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it. The great initiator. He initiates everything. He creates everything. Not only does he create the heavens, stretch them out, spreads forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, but he is, of course, the great life giver. He giveth bread unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. And, of course, that's a very, very relevant line, isn't it, in these days? He giveth breath unto the people upon it. And surely it is for him who gives life to take life and not for us to take life. I believe that that is the great, great verse against suicide in whatever form. And if there are any of you here tonight contemplating it, I say to you, it is the forbidden way. God gives life, and God takes life. We must be content to wait until he takes us. And of course, that takes us into the whole realm of the unborn and the whole argument that is in there. But I think that this is a very important line. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. Let's be very careful. 
what we do with human life. How are you treating that breath he gave you? Are you choking it up with nicotine and alcohol and drugs? How sad. A lovely gift of this breath that God has given you to pollute it. Well, he, he gave it to you, so treat it as a real gift from him and watch it and care for it and the Spirit to them that walk therein. Now, you may not agree with me, but I still think that the Lord Jesus is in view in this verse. I think that God is still talking about the Messiah. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Now, let's just stay with that little line for a minute. A light to the Gentiles. On Saturday morning, I was having my breakfast in Leeds. It was a very nice breakfast. The man in the house had made it. Saturday morning was his time to make it, while the rest sat back. And he made it very well. Thank the Lord for that. And I was enjoying my breakfast. When suddenly I noticed all these people going by the window, loads of people. They were dressed in a very distinct way. And they said to me, ah, you know, they're the Jews. We have many, 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 I think he said, thousands of them in this district of Leeds. They're all going to the synagogue. And here I was, eating away at my toast or whatever, and loads of these people going by and families, ladies with hats and men with little caps and all sorts of things, dressed in dark suits, going off to the synagogue. Now, I've always wanted to visit a synagogue just to see what goes on. And I've never really had the opportunity because I rang up the rabbi here in Belfast and discovered they didn't have one at the time at the synagogue in Belfast to find out his view on the Song of Solomon because Jewish folk fascinate me. They are a wonderful people. And I thought, well, let's go and see what's in the synagogue. So as I munched my toast, I said to my host, how about going to the synagogue? Well, he thought he had problems with North, North of Ireland preachers. I'll not say in what areas, but uh, he was trying to weigh me up, and uh, I think he had problems with that one. He said, I'd love to go, because he'd always been waiting the chance. So uh, I said, okay, if you'd like to go, I'd love to go. I'd love to go, he said. And I thought he was going to put me out of the house, but he didn't. And he took me away and put me in the car, and we beetled along to this huge synagogue well. I think he was as nervous as I was. And we came along through the beautiful garden of remembrance in the synagogue to the six million Jews who were slaughtered by Hitler, and we came to the door, and we very gently pushed it open, and there they were standing with beautiful prayer shawls on and lovely little caps, and uh, with heads down, we gently went forward and we said to the men at the door, very interesting, the men at the door, you know, we said, uh, would we be allowed to observe? Where are you from? <laughs> oh. I thought, it's all up, Lord. I said, well, I'm from Belfast. <laughs> I said, you've, you've heard of that place? Oh, yes, yes. No harm in that, he said, I thought. Good. He said, now, you can't just go in at the moment. Now, you'll have to wear these little caps. And I thought, well, it'll cover my bald patch anyway. <laughs> and he said, you'll have to put these little caps on, and we'll take you in, but just hang on a minute. So we sat down, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And I thought, oh, dear, they're checking me out here. Uh, my other friend with me was from Leeds. Where are you from? Well, 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 I'm from around the corner here, up the road. They'd never heard of him before. So eventually, after about 12 minutes or so, a very nice man came along and gave us these little head coverings and whatever, and in we went. Well, you talk about a morning. 
We were taken right into the middle of these men, and there in the middle of that beautiful building, they were reading uh, the law. They begin at 9 o'clock in the morning, and they go on until 12. And you think, I'm bad. <laughs> From 9 until 12, and how beautifully they read it. Beautiful. They sing it. They had an opera singer there who is a lovely Jewish gentleman, sang the, the law, and we were given a man who explained to us what was going on. So we watched very carefully. Well, the amazing thing was they did an awful lot of talking whenever they were reading the law. They were coming and going and how you doing, Jimmy, and, or whatever he was, and, and a lot of talking, you see. And I watched this very carefully. And then I noticed a man going round and round the synagogue with a huge top hat on. I thought, I wonder what he is now. So I said to the gentleman, tell me, I said, who's the man with the top hat on? He said, he's the chief shusher. I said, the what? <laughs> the chief shusher. He's the chief usher and shusher. He goes around saying, shh, keep quiet, shh, keep quiet. <laughs> so maybe we could do with him in a few meetings without the top hat, but there he was, very interesting. And as it went on across the morning, you know, as a Christian, sitting watching, I was absolutely fascinated by it all. And then, of course, they had the, 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 where, where the law came, which is the Torah, you know, they have this huge scroll, and they go up, and the curtains are pulled back, representing the Ark of the Covenant, and they take out the scrolls, and they carry them with great reverence and ceremony down, and then they carry it up into the rostrum uh, in the middle of the building, and they hold up the law. And you know, as they go past, these Jewish gentlemen, of course, the women are separated on the galleries. Uh, all with their heads covered except one that I could see. And I asked about this, and, and there on the gallery were all these women. I said, why do you not allow the women to sit with the men? Well, the women distract the men in prayer. And I thought, and you need a chief shusher. But nevertheless, the women are separated and not allowed to come in amongst the men as they worship in the Jewish synagogue. They are cut off. And some uh, ortho very orthodox synagogues, they're actually behind a grill. There was no grail in this one, but uh, they were cut off from us. And as they went around and reading the law, people were touching this scroll and kissing it. And then, of course, they were facing the east, and they were praying towards Jerusalem east in the building, and they always pray towards the east. And then they all got up together, and they faced, you know, I'm standing this way, and suddenly they're all facing me. They're all going east in their prayers. You know, it was very moving to watch. And then this was the bit that, that really touched me, you know. It was a little boy's bar mitzvah when he became 13. You know, come 13, you become a man in the Jewish faith and so on. Little boy comes and he stands in front of the rabbi, little tiny chap of 13. And in front of all these very learned gentlemen, because this gentleman was digging me and saying, he's a judge and he's a solicitor, and there was another fellow in the corner and he was going, amen, every now and again. He said, oh, he likes to be heard. And I thought, <laughs> not much different from some other places I come across. And anyway, there he was, very human people, but absolutely animated by what was happening. And when the law was held up to them, you know, how they sang, how they sang about the law, and they worshipped it, and they glorified it, and they, they spoke of it, and the precepts of it, and so on. And then the little boy stood up, and the young rabbi, who was a bit younger than me, he stood up, and he said, now he said, Naming him by his name, you have now become a man. And everywhere you go, he said, although you're only 13, you will represent jury. And whenever on a Saturday you are not allowed to go to parties, but you have to, to eat food where your friends are at a party, you may be at a party, but you're not allowed to eat certain amount of food or whatever, you'll have to explain why you don't eat that food. Whenever you go into school and you can't play games on a certain day, on a Saturday, because you have to rise early to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, they will say to you, why do you not do it? And you will represent jury. Wherever you go, the responsibility of jury will fall upon your shoulders. And as that rabbi led upon that child the importance of who he was, what his faith was, what he would represent, 
I sat there and I thought long, long thoughts. Long thoughts. In fact, I almost felt like Paul. I felt like jumping up and saying, just a minute, ye men of Israel. But I doubt if I would have got out very quickly. I felt like saying, just a minute, just a minute. That great epistle to the Hebrews says that there is something better than the law. I wanted to get up and almost sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And my, how they loved the law and reverenced the law. And I, I, I felt like Paul. I wish I had been like him, you know, because he would have jumped up and he would have said so and got put in jail for it. But maybe I'm a card, but I listened very carefully and I just longed to say, look, man, look. Look, here, back in Isaiah, is the Messiah shown forth. And here in this line does it say, I, the Lord, have called thee, verse 6, in righteousness, will hold thine hand, will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Here is one of you who is used by God and brought along by God and raised by God, and our lovely Savior, the Savior of the world, comes forth. And as he comes forth, he comes forth as a light to the Gentiles to reach us where we are. How wonderful the law was for the initiated. How great it is for those if you are born into that faith. But my, what a gospel is ours. Whenever right out of this comes the better. All this law but a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. All this ritual but pointing to the Lamb of God who would die on the cross for our sins. How I long to communicate that on Saturday morning. And I've thought long thoughts on this verse since. To open the blind eyes, verse 7. Think of that. Here is this Savior who now comes right out of all of it to open blind eyes. And his grace is a far higher standard than the Jewish law. And if you're a Jew, my friend, you know that we love you. And we have no disrespect for you. If you're watching this video, no way. What a lovely time I had with those men and how gracious they were to me. And I appreciated them explaining things to me, you know. We're not, we're, we're not anti-Semitic in any way. But let me say from all of my heart uh, to you tonight, if you're watching or wherever you are, look at these wonderful words here. Here is a Savior who opens the blind eyes to bring the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither shall my praise uh, to graven image. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. And they spring forth. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Think of all the new covenant which is far greater than the old covenant. The new covenant and the new, new gr this grace that we're under is so different. As I was saying, the law has a high standard, but think of the law of grace. It says, you know, said Jesus, the law says how, what it says about divorce and so on. But I say to you that if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery already in your heart. And the law says one thing, but grace has a far higher standard. The very look of lust is condemned by grace. You have heard Jesus said about this. You have heard about that. But I say unto you, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of these Jews, scribes, and Pharisees. You'll not enter the kingdom. You know what the law says about prayer and so on. You, we have done the Sermon on the Mount in great detail here. If you want to get the tapes on that, you can. It was the turning of the tide for us in this class. It was then that things really began to open up for us in this work when we studied that together. Shall we ever forget those times as we saw how that the law had a standard and you could keep it outwardly and appear a great fellow in the eyes of your fellow Jews. But this new grace that has come looks upon your heart and how you are in your heart. And God is looking on the heart, not just the outward appearance. 
how different it is. Don't ever think that Christian grace is footloose and fancy free. The standard under grace is far higher than the law ever was. And those of us who name the name of Christ, wherever you go, you represent grace, the new covenant. And just as that little boy was told by that rabbi on Saturday, you'll represent jury. How many of you here tonight have gone through the waters of baptism and obeyed the Lord? How are you and I fulfilling those before the eyes of the unconverted around us? as they see us and watch us, because we represent Christianity to them and the truth of the Christian gospel and the church of Jesus Christ. You can't, as the rabbi said to the little boy, you can't have all these learned men or the rabbi with you at school or whatever, neither can you, friend, have all the theologians with you on the factory floor when you're asked hard questions, but you represent your Savior wherever you go. How wonderful it is and what a higher standard. Behold, the former things are come to pass and new things do I declare. This is the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, coming. And of course, God must have the glory. He won't give it to anybody else. Christ is the head of these new things mentioned in verse 9. But now to turn away from those deep and stormy waters to verse 10. The plain fact is that songless saints should be non-existent. Now, I want to say something very straight here. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that are, is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit. Now, Kedar was a son of Ishmael, and those are the tribes that follow from Kedar, or the tribe that follows from Kedar. Of people. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man, and he shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar, and he shall prevail against his enemies. But from verse 10 to verse number 12, I think I could write over that songless saints should be non existent. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Well, I wonder, as I often say to you, how much you sing. Let me ask you in the words of Charles Swindle, tell me, did you sing on the way home from uh, your church service last Sunday? No hands up now, but did you? Did you do any singing on Monday, apart from the church choir? When you drove to work this morning, did you sing? You say, sing? Brother, die. <laughs> Round the supper table together at nights, do you ever sing? You say, sing? At the supper table? As you dress for the day in the morning, do you ever sing? You say, do you want the, all the windows to break in the house? No, I'm trying to be serious. The chances are you didn't even sing before or after you spent some time with the Lord any day last week. Why? The Spirit-filled saint is the song-filled saint. And if there isn't much singing in your life, something wrong. Animals can't sing. They try, but they can't. Pews can't sing, pulpits can't sing, Bibles can't sing, buildings can't sing. You can sing. You say not very well. I'm not talking about whether you can sing well or not. I'm talking about making melody in your heart to your Lord. And your melody, when you sing to the Lord, is broadcast right into heaven, and God hears it. Whenever and wherever you sing, my friend, concentrate on the words. And if it helps, close your eyes. You say, they'll all laugh at me. They'll laugh at you anyway. You say, that's true when I sing. But if it even helps, close your eyes. I sometimes have to close my eyes to concentrate on what I'm doing. Let yourself get lost in that lovely melody 
Sing often with your friends and with members of your family. It helps to melt down all sorts of invisible barriers. Why not, before you have tea tomorrow night, get mum and dad, brother and sister, and say, look, I know you're all going to throw me out, but let's sing grace tonight. I say, oh, go on, try it. You say you want a revolution? Yes. The first sign of a spirit-filled life is singing. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And what's the first sign of it? Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I just throw that out as a little practical suggestion. You're not auditioning for a choir. You're making melody in your heart. Never mind how pitiful you may sound. Sing loud enough to drown those deafening thoughts that clamor for attention. Sing out and sing often. That's what it says. Sing, verse 10, unto the Lord a new song. And you'll be amazed what will happen. Sing on your bike, in the plane, in your car. I went into a restaurant yesterday, a little tiny coffee house, and I sat down. And there was a man sitting. In fact, I think it was today, if I remember right. <laughs> Where am I, Lord? And he was sitting there with his wife. And suddenly, he started to whistle. And I thought, that sounds familiar. He was whistling in the corner of the coffee house, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And I went over to him and I said, Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, you know, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. I said to him, I said, uh, Keep going, brother. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. I said, just keep praising him. I said, he's an incomparable Savior, isn't he? He looked up at me. <laughs> I never said, how are you? I never said, where are you from? I never said, you know, I go here and I'm this. I just said, keep praising him, brother. And he looked up at me. He came up for air and he said, Praise the Lord. I don't know his name yet. He doesn't know who I am. I beat it out the door. And he wasn't cracked in the head. He was waiting to pay the bill. And he was whistling quietly in the corner. He wasn't annoying anybody. Wouldn't have worried me if he had. We've lost our ability so often to sing. Now, it's very clear. There's a little word to you. Now, we have a man here tonight who is a member of a very famous quartet of men who have been singing in this land for many, many, many years, the Woodville Quintet. And he comes to this class every week. He's one of the most faithful members of this class for many years. And I've heard him sing and preached with him too. I'd like to pay public testimony to him tonight and to those mighty men who sing with him, those men all over the land singing to the Lord. Well we could pick up something from them, couldn't we? Songless saints should be non-existent. But here is the God who now moves very, very fast to avenge against the enemies. He shall go forth as a mighty man, stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry and roar, shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry, verse 14, like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once, just like a woman in childbirth, where she can hold back from crying no longer because the child is about to be born. God says, I'm going to move to protect my people. Now, of course, this is prophecy concerning the children of Israel in this great city. We've been thinking about Babylon in their 70-year captivity. The great second exodus is about to happen. And he says, I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs, that's the enemies, and I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. We'll see how that literally became fulfilled through Darius who set the people free, drying up pools. That little verse is very important because uh, he diverted a river to set them free. 
and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. Isn't that lovely? Even if you're blind, I'll lead you by a way you've never been before. I'll lead you in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. And you sit here tonight and you say, boy, Derek, that's a great promise. I tell you it is. Maybe you're worried about the future tonight. Think of that. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. That's your Lord. But what did the people of God do? No, they, they didn't believe all this. They were hard. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed. They that trust in graven images and that say to molten images, ye are our gods. Yes, I'm going to defeat them. But what about my people? Verse 18. Would you listen to me? You're deaf, he says. Would you look because you're blind that you may see? Who is blind but my servant? My own people. I promised you I'll do this. I promise you I'll never forsake you. I promise you I'll defeat your enemies. I promise you the Messiah will come. I promise you I will set you free. I'll not forsake you. I will do, these things will I do unto them, verse 16, and not forsake them. Despite all of their sin, all of their mistakes, all of their idolatry, I love them, and I'm going to do these things for them. But who is blind but my servant? And you know, I'm, I have to admit it. It's true, isn't it? Why is it that God does so much for us, and we forget all his benefits? And we say, yes, yes, the Lord's brought me so far, but oh, if you only knew the problem I've got now. Look at that verse, friend. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as the messenger I sent? Who is blind as he that is in your NIV committed? And blind as the Lord's servant. He sees many things, but he doesn't observe. He opens his ears, but he doesn't hear anything my people. Now the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. My people, who among you will give ear to this? And who will hearken to hear for the time to come? And then comes the verse. Who gave Jacob for a spoil anyway? And who gave Israel to the robbers? Who sent you into exile under the Babylonians that saying? I sent you. He against whom we have sinned. For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they disobedient unto his law. Now, I want to be very careful here, and I don't want to be arrogant, but I want to say to you, my friend, if God promises you as a believer all of that, and he still does in Christ, we've been grafted into this branch, and what a glory it is. Brought in Gentiles who didn't deserve it through this great Messiah who came, God's beloved Son. And these promises are yea and amen to his people. If you tonight turn a deaf ear to your Lord's cry, and you turn a, a blind eye to the Lord's promises, I put out a warning. I tell you now that you will suffer the chastisement of the Lord. God will chasten you. He will. You ever hear about a fellow called James Sullivan? Now, this is very serious. And in the 1960s, he had the largest youth group in all of America. And he was mightily blessed of God. Thousands of young people involved. And he blew his town wide open with this youth work for the Lord. And that's not all he blew wide open. 
Along the way, he sacrificed his health and his family. And as he blazed along the success track, Sullivan became a difficult man to keep up with, let alone live with, and his wife, Carolyn, was getting tired. And so were his children, who seldom saw their father. And when they did, he was irritable. And although he never realized it at the time, Sullivan's full-throttle lifestyle was actually an escape technique. Listen to him quote from his book, The Frog who never became a prince. I was a man who existed in a shell with guilt and resentment and hatred welling up within me, and the resulting hard feelings I developed became almost insurmountable. And what happened? Wasn't this guy a Christian? Wasn't he working for Jesus? Wasn't he spreading the gospel? Wasn't he reaching the youth? Yes, indeed. But Sullivan substituted activity for living and busyness for meaningful priorities. And one night his wife said to him, do you know or do you even care that from the middle of September until today you have not been home one night? And not long after that she broke emotionally and he contemplated suicide. Now, sir, are you that man so busy for your Lord you think that you are wrecking everything around you. I speak straight because I feel this. Let me put it another way. Did you ever hear about the little class who had a, a newspaper and they had a story in it and the legend was that all the animals decided they would try to be meaningful and to meet the needs and the problems of the new world. So the, the animals organized the school. And the activity and curriculum in the school was running and climbing and swimming and flying. And to make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals had to take all the subjects, said the story. Now the duck was excellent in swimming. In fact, that he was even better than his instructor. But he had only passing grades in flying, and he was desperately poor at the running. And since he was slow in running, he had to drop swimming and stay after school to practice running. And this caused his webbed feet to be badly worn so that he was only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable, so nobody worried about it except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class, said the legend, in running, but he developed a nervous twitch in his leg muscles because of so much makeup work and swimming. And the squirrel was absolutely excellent in climbing, but he encountered constant frustration in the flying class <laughs> because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the treetop down. He developed Lots of problems from overexertion, and he only got a C in climbing, and he got a D in running. The eagle was a problem child and was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing classes, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but he insisted on using his own way to get there. And the obvious moral of the story is a simple one. Each creature had its own set of capabilities in which it will naturally excel unless it is expected or forced to fill a mold that it doesn't fit. And a whole lot of us are trying to fill molds that we can't fit. And we're trying to get into things that God never meant for us. And we're frustrated and worried and driving ourselves silly. And it's all wrong. Watch the Lord doesn't chasten you. A duck is a duck and only a duck. It's built to swim, not to run or fly or climb. A squirrel is a squirrel and only that, and to move out of its forte, climbing, and then expect that the swim or fly will drive a squirrel nuts. <laughs> and eagles are very beautiful creatures in the air, but they're no good in a foot race. And the rabbit will win every time, unless, of course, the eagle gets hungry. And what's true in the forest is true of Christians in the family and of your family under your roof. Now, if you're trying to do something the Lord never wanted you to do and you're insisting on doing it, you'll be chastised. Is there someone looking into my face tonight and you're involved in sexual sin and you are determined to go on no matter what God says? 
Watch that God does not move swiftly to chasten you. If I got in my heart an unkind spirit, no matter how much I preach, my unkind spirit is getting in the way of God's Word. I will be chastened. Somebody here tonight and God has spoken to you about baptism and you refuse, or the Lord's Supper and you refuse, watch that He does not chasten you. These people had all of these promises. The prophet pled with them to repent and believe God, but they wouldn't do it. And God chastised them and sent them into exile. And whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So at the end of the chapter comes the great challenge. Let me do what God wants me to do. Let me be content in it. And let me be humble about it at the same time. Let's pray. Bless your word, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us. Send us home rejoicing. For Jesus' sake. Amen.